Hi and welcome. The KLJ-7 is the fire control radar FCR mounted in the JF-17. It was introduced in the mid-2000s and is considered a modern radar, more or less on par with other fourth-generation fighters available in DCS. Operating in X-band, it is capable of tracking up to 40 contacts, 10 when operating in track while scan, and can engage two at the same time in BVR scenarios. Moreover, it provides air-to-ground mapping, target searching, terrain avoidance and other capabilities, making it a good all-around system. This video introduces the main characteristics of the FCR and the information presented to the pilot. Later videos will focus on radar modes and peculiarities, including jamming effects, speed gates, etc. Characteristics Contrary to the KLJ-7A, its more modern AESA relative, the Dash 7 is a quite typical mechanically steered radar, in line with most of what we have in DCS. In fact, if you have played any third gen plus fighter jet, you can probably jump straight into the JF 17 and operate the radar fairly proficiently. The KLJ 7 supports, in fact, several familiar scan modes, such as track while scan, range while search, velocity search, and single target track. Ad hoc modes are also available for ACM and tracking targets for single and multiple engagements and air to ground. Air to air radar information is usually represented on a B scope which displays the range in nautical miles on the ordinate and the relative azimuth on the abscissa. The latter, when referring to contacts or talking about geometry, is also known as ATA or antenna train angle. Air to ground modes use the PPI format or plan position indicator. In this configuration, the point of view is not distorted as in a B-scope display, making it more suitable for ground mapping and targeting. Later videos will discuss specific display configurations pertinent to peculiar modes, such as velocity search. Air-to-air -air overview. The scanned airspace volume in air-to-air -air mode spans from plus or minus 15 degrees, one bar, to plus or minus 60 degrees, four bars. The latter mode requires circa 8.1 seconds to complete a full sweep. At a range of 40 nautical miles, the bar settings cover circa 4 bars, 36,000 feet, angle, 8.43 degrees, 3 bars, 28,000 feet, angle, 6.57 degrees, 2 bars, 20,000 feet, angle, 4.7 degrees, 1 bar, 12,000 feet, angle, 2.83 degrees. Similarly to most other radars, the coverage angle and the number of bars are not proportional, as the bars overlap slightly. The display provides the two altitude boundaries directly on the cursor, updated in real time. For Ebi Inizio players, a bar is the name of the horizontal scan movement of the antenna, left to right and vice versa. Multiple bars can be stacked to increase the amount of airspace covered. In a sense, Bars are not that different from pieces of Lego piled one above the other, and the length of the Lego stack changes according to the selected azimuth. Back to the radar. The antenna pattern moves from left to right in odd bars and right to left in even bars. For instance, four bars follow this pattern. The three bar setting is available only in track while scan and follows a different pattern. The elevation at which the antenna looks can be identified using the elevation strobe located on the left side of the display. As Tomcat Rios know, this indicator comes in very handy on several occasions, albeit modern displays can show the altitude bracket illuminated by the radar. AB Initio pilots especially should keep well in mind that the radar volume resembles more a truncated pyramid than a parallel piped. As these simplified sketches show, there are blind spots around the main illuminated area. Thus, the pilot must change the antenna elevation angle according to the expected threat, mission, terrain and so on. If a section flies together, they can stack their radars and increase the overall scanned area. These topics have already been discussed on flyandwire.com. Back to the KLJ-7, the azimuth can be set to different values, plus or minus 15 degrees, plus or minus 30 degrees, 
plus or minus 60 degrees. 60 degrees is also the widest setting. In the other cases, the scan volume is centered around the cursor rather than being a separate control. Note that the scale of the display does not change, and vertical dashed lines delimit the illuminated airspace. Once again, Track While Scan has its own set of options, plus or minus 10 degrees, 4 bars, plus or minus 25 degrees, and the mentioned 3 bars, plus or minus 60 degrees, 2 bars. Track While Scan is a peculiar radar mode that requires a fixed refresh of the illuminated contacts, and this causes the unusual combinations of azimuth and bars. The details of TWIZ will be discussed in a dedicated video. The available range settings are 10, 20, 40 and 80 nautical miles. Certain radars use the defined range as a data processing parameter, but this should not be the case for the KJL-7. Take this sentence with a grain of salt, though. If true, however, the range setting modifies the scale of visualized airspace information. The width of the three notches located on the right-end side of the scope changes accordingly. For instance, at an 80 nautical mile scale, each mark represents 20 nautical miles. At 20 nautical miles, each represents 5 nautical miles. Two pulse repetition frequency, PRF, are available, medium and high, plus a third option that combines the two labelled auto. An in-depth discussion about the differences between the two is beyond the scope of this video, but here is a very quick and dirty recap. High PRF is a high energy mode, so to speak, that works best at a high V sub C, or closure rate. It takes full advantage of the Doppler effect to find contacts and separate them from the ground. But this also means that two blind zones exist. The first one is a notch in the waveform characteristic, and the radar modus operandi itself causes it. This is where the notching term comes from. To provide look-down, shoot-down capabilities, the radar tries to remove ground returns, de facto, filtering anything moving at the same relative speed as the terrain, including other aircraft. This filter is called the MLC filter, or main lobe clutter filter. The second is the lack of speed difference, which limits the Doppler effect and may make it difficult to reliably track targets flying at a high target aspect or low aspect angle. In reality, and with modern radars, both effects are not as significant a problem as they were in the past. However, the effectiveness of notching is particularly exaggerated in DCS, especially when missile seekers are involved. Medium PRF is a more recent and clever addition, Whereas in the past low PRF was used as an all-aspect mode, medium PRF required some technological advancements and the digital revolution of the 4th gen fighters before becoming widespread. Medium PRF filters return waves by range and Doppler, and therefore, it is vastly more reliable in situations where high PRF suffers the most. On the other hand, it has a reduced detection range, and its performance at low altitudes is mediocre. The Auto option allows automatic scan using both high and medium PRF in an alternate fashion. For instance, a first 4-bar sweep is MED, high, MED, high. The second continues with high, MED, high, MED, and the cycle restarts. The bottom of the display shows additional information, such as the JF-17 speed and altitude. air-to-ground overview. Similarly to air-to-air, air-to-ground offers several different modes and submodels, such as mapping, terrain avoidance, and targeting. Information is displayed using a PPI display rather than a B-scope, thus preventing the otherwise inevitable distortion. Unfortunately, some radar modes are unavailable in DCS due to the SIM's limitations. For example, alike to the F4E's antenna polarization setting, Weather avoidance does not interact with the in-game situation yet. Hopefully in the future, these settings will have meaningful usage. The display shows several controls and settings. Common controls include azimuth, range, gain adjustments. Not all settings are available in every mode, and more details will be added in later dedicated videos about the air-to-ground radar functions. In fact, there is not a lot to say about the KLJ-7 in these modes of operation, without entering their details and introducing aspects such as targeting pods and ordnance employment. I hope you have found this video useful. Thanks for watching and take care.